In this lecture, we will be delving into the centerpiece of international sales law, the CISG, the United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, a convention that goes beyond private international law. The CISG does not only offer conflict of law rules, it offers substantive sales law of an international character. Obviously, international sales law has to do with global trade that fuels our consumer society. And you might remember in that context, Niall Ferguson's killer apps, the consumer society is one of them. The consumer society that, as Ferguson puts it, propels economic growth even more than technological change itself. You might also remember that much of global trade is done through the oceans, with maritime shipping routes accounting for two thirds of the overall volume. And of course, you are aware that all of this is greatly facilitated by the rules of the international law of the sea. And I think you probably also remember that global merchandise trade has consistently grown faster than the overall world economy, reflecting the success of the GATT and the WTO trade system. And here you have another element of statistics. On this chart, you can see that even though we are supposed to move towards a modern service economy, merchandise trade is still far more important today than trade in commercial services. Worldwide merchandise trade still represents several times the volume of trade in services. In terms of private law, global trade consists, of course, of countless cross-border sales transactions. Contracts for the international sale of goods are the core private law instrument in global merchandise trade. And this is what we are going to focus on. Here you have our program. We will be looking at the significance of the CISG and how it came into existence. We will be dealing with the scope and structure of the CISG. We will have a special focus on comparing the CISG with the Swiss Code of Obligations. And we will be discussing issues. Let me turn to our first topic. What is the CISG and how was it made? The CISG, whose full title is United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, is also referred to as the Vienna Convention because it has been adopted at a diplomatic conference held in Vienna. And it is also referred to as the UN Sales Convention. The purpose of the CISG, as it is specified in the preamble, is to contribute to the removal of legal barriers in international trade by providing uniform rules which govern contracts for the international sale of goods and take into account the different social, economic and legal systems. The CISG has a large coverage throughout the world. So far, it has been ratified by all major economies with some major exceptions, namely the United Kingdom and India. The CISG is about standardizing substantive sales law rules. It goes beyond regulating conflict of laws. It contains substantive sales law. And this brings me to an important distinction, the distinction between private international law or conflict of laws and international private law, which is substantive law of an international character. It sounds pretty much the same, private international law and international private law, but it's entirely different. Private international law is what is regulated in the Swiss Code of Private International Law on a national level and in a number of treaties, including the Lugano Convention, the Brussels Regulation and the Hague Conventions in the field of private international law. In contrast, international private law is what is contained in the CISG, 
and in other treaties such as the 1995 Unidroit Convention on Stolen or Illegally Exported Cultural Objects. But the CISG is by far the most important example of international private law. So uniform private law rules, substantive private law rules. Another distinction that is important in the context of the CISG is the distinction between two categories of treaties, namely non-self-executing treaties and self-executing treaties. Non-self-executing treaties, as you surely remember, are treaties that need to be implemented through national legislation, whereas self-executing treaties are treaties that are directly applicable without any implementation measures being needed. Examples of treaties that are typically meant to be non-self-executing are the agreement establishing the World Trade Organization and its annexes, namely the GATT, the GATS and the TRIPS agreement. Treaties that are typically meant to be self-executing include the European Convention on Human Rights, the 1949 Geneva Conventions in the area of humanitarian law, the Lugano Convention and the Hague Conventions in the field of private international law, and also the CISG. The CISG is a typical example of a treaty that is meant to be self-executing, directly applicable. In the next step, I would like to say a little bit about how the CISG was created. In the early stages of the rather long process that finally led up to the creation of this convention, that is known as the single most successful convention in the field of international commercial law. In the early stages of this process, it was the pioneering work of one of our towering figures of international law in the picture here that proved to be groundbreaking. This was German law professor Ernst Rabel. Ernst Rabel was a professor at the universities of Leipzig, Basel, Kiel, Göttingen, Munich, Berlin, and after he emigrated to the United States, Ann Arbor and Harvard. He was also the founder of the Journal for Comparative and International Private Law, the Rabel Journal, and in addition he was the initiator of the discussions on the unification of the rules of law for international sales transactions led by the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law, UNIDROIT. Let me try to give you an overview of the whole unification process using this timeline on my blackboard. Ernst Rabel served as a member of UNIDROIT, the Institute for the Unification of Private Law in Rome, that was founded in 1926 and began to operate in 1928. And it was on Rabel's proposition that UNIDROIT started to work towards the unification of international sales law since the late 1920s. Let me add some words about UNIDROIT, the institute located in this beautiful building in Rome, Villa Aldobrandini. The International Institute for the Unification of Private Law, or Institut International pour l'Unification du Droit Privé, UNIDROIT, was originally founded as an auxiliary organ of the League of Nations in 1926, and it is now an independent intergovernmental organization based on the UNIDROIT statute, and it has uh, a little more than 60 member states today. Let me give you an impression of the beautiful location. The Institute also features this library that serves its purpose, which is to study needs and methods for modernizing, harmonizing and coordinating private and in particular commercial law and to formulate uniform law instruments, principles and rules to achieve those objectives. Much of UNIDRA's work is typically done at conferences that bring together experts from all over the world. 
The problem is that this institution, UNIDROIT, that the whole process of the unification of international sales law began in the late 1920s. But those efforts were interrupted during World War II. Soon after the end of World War II, UNIDRA continued the efforts at unifying international sales law. On the initiative of the Dutch government, conferences were held in The Hague, and a 1964 conference produced two conventions, the ULF and the ULIS. The ULF was the uniform law on the formation of contracts for the international sale of goods, and it contained rules on contract formation. The ULIS was a convention entitled Uniform Law on the International Sale of Goods, and it provided rules on the rights and obligation of the seller and the buyer. However, those two conventions were largely a failure. They failed to attract more than just a few ratifications in the newly independent countries created in the process of decolonization. The ULF and the ULIS were widely perceived as unbalanced and too much in favor of Western sellers of manufactured goods. Some major industrialized countries, such as France and the United States of America, did not ratify the conventions either. In the end, only nine states became members of the ULF and the ULIS, which was obviously not a sufficient basis for conventions aiming at providing uniform rules for sales contracts in global trade. That the ULF and the ULIS did not seem to be attractive enough became clear fairly soon. In the meantime, the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, UNCITRAL, had been established in 1966 as a subsidiary body of the United Nations General Assembly. And in 1968, this commission launched a new initiative to unify international sales law. In this new unification effort, the ULF and the ULIS were taken as a starting point, but their rules were further developed with a view to achieve a more balanced system of international sales law. In 1980, the Ancitral Initiative culminated in a diplomatic conference held in Vienna where experts from different legal systems around the world represented a total of 62 nations. That was the conference where the final version of the CISG was elaborated. Eventually, the convention was adopted on the 5th of April 1980. In its scope, the CISG still reflects its origins in the ULF and the ULIS. Its rules cover the formation of international sales contracts on the one hand, and the rights and obligations of the seller and the buyer on the other. After the required first 10 ratifications had come together, the CISG entered into force on the 1st of January 1988. Our next topic is the scope and structure of the CISG. This will be discussed in the next podcast. So see you there.